Welcome, everybody, to our Facebook Live show this evening. I'm Charmaine Tanner, and I wanted to welcome you. I'm excited because we have a special guest from California, Stephen Hinkle, who is a disability rights advocate. And tonight, Stephen's going to be talking about the hidden curriculum, some of those skills that our students need to learn, but don't necessarily get the support um, to be able to be that fully engaged in social skills and the social aspects of school and after school. So if this is your first time with us, I'm Charmaine Tanner. I'm an advocate, a parent, a retired teacher, and author of a number one best-selling book, The Art of Advocacy, A Parent's Guide to the Collaborative IEP Process. So I wanna welcome Stephen. And Stephen, can you, I, all of a sudden I don't see your, your, your picture. <laughs> so technology here. It says no participants are sending video and I have video on. So let me see if I can, two people are in the meeting, recording is on. And I think Stephen may have left, and now we'll have to get him back on here. So let me send him a message and make sure we can get him back on. I know we just practiced this. <laughs> so hopefully, so let's see. It says broadcasting. Uh, well, we do have a special guest. He's just hiding in the internet somewhere right now, right? So let me see. I have to, I don't know. I'm gonna tell him to try and go off and then come back on. Try and get back. On. Okay, so I just sent him a text. Let's see if this is going to work. It's the magic of technology that sometimes works and sometimes it wants to see how we're doing. So let me see what I see on Facebook Live. Hmm. Well, I don't know why. Let's see. Okay, so Stephen said he's in the process. Give him a couple minutes. And so if you're on my business page, Visions and Voices Together, This is where we're gonna be with Steven. And I see myself <laughs> and Natalie. Welcome, Natalie. Let's see. I'm gonna be with Steven. And let me turn my, so Natalie's on, Brandy's on. Now we just need our, our guest, right, Steven. So I think he had a computer glitch, so he signed off, and he'll be back on. So, Natalie, I know that you are hoping to get maybe some tips tonight that might be useful. So when we get Stephen on and he starts doing the presentation, feel free to type in comments, or if you have a question, and Brandy, do the same thing if you've got a question or a comment. Um, and I'll be checking on the Facebook page. So then we can relay that to Stephen. So hopefully he'll be back on soon. Because this is, you know, that's it's kind of like live TV when they say, oh, look what happens for live TV, right? Um, and this is live Facebook. So 
The other thing is, Natalie or Brandy, do you know right now maybe some questions that you might want to ask? So then I can let Stephen know from his fans. What's up? I'll, maybe what I'll do is I'll just give a little bit of background about Stephen. He is, like I said in, I think, my email to everybody, an international speaker. He got to speak in Australia this past May, and he was meeting with teachers and families in Australia talking about self-determination and how to help our students, our kids with disabilities, learn to advocate for themselves and um, have those skills where they can speak up for themselves and be able to share with others the kinds of supports they need or what their interests are, especially when you look at kids going into high school and choosing classes and things like that. I've also worked with um, Stephen in Tulsa. We were both consultants down there in Tulsa School District a few years ago. And I was specifically working with high school teachers with Peak Parent Center that had a contract. And Stephen was there to talk to some elementary teachers and also elementary students. So it's so wonderful when he is able to connect with the students. Um, I think the kids really look up to him and he has a way of connecting with them. So people are always very excited. Um, Brandy, I know you've heard speak, uh, Stephen speak in Denver at Peaks conferences, and you've also had Stephen come to Pueblo, Colorado. So do you want to put any comments in the box about um, what you know about Stephen? I see your comment. It says, just happy to hear him again. No particular question for now, but do you want to maybe share with Natalie, who's on here with us, um, you know, maybe one of the lessons that you've learned from Stephen? And I know Brandy's on here with her son, Clay, too, so that's always fun. And Natalie, were you guys out to dinner tonight? I saw your post <laughs> earlier. <laughs> so I'm not sure why Stephen's having a hard time getting back on here. Let me see if I can send him another text and see what the deal is. He said he's rebooting. Sorry about that in the process. So hopefully he'll be back soon. Um, the other thing I think that's important um, for parents and for students is to learn from adults with disabilities. And Stephen um, happens to have autism. And like so many kids with disabilities, it's their parents that are really their, you know, big cheerleaders, especially when they're younger. And Stephen's mom was exactly that for him. So um, he'll be able to share some specific stories, especially in elementary school, some of the things that his mom did to um, advocate for him and what it was like when he was more excluded in school versus when he started being included in general ed classes and different activities. So. He, I can't remember, Brandy, do you remember? I can't remember where he got his undergraduate degree, but I, it might have been in San Diego where he lives, but he got his master's degree um, from University of Arizona. I think that's what it is, and the one that's in Flagstaff. So he, you know, just independently was able to leave his home in San Diego and drive to Arizona and attend classes there and he got his master's degree from Arizona. And since then, he's been doing a lot of public speaking. I think he's been in about half of the states that we have in our country. Um, and he, like I said, it's always a learning experience when you hear an adult with a disability talk about their school experiences, talk about what it was like growing up, what he wishes, you know, could have happened differently. 
I know when we were, when I was talking to him before we went live, he was telling me about some new topics that he's been um, exploring and writing presentations for. And one of the new topics that he's working on is sexuality with people with disabilities. And, you know, I think as parents, that can be a hard topic with any of our kids. And sometimes it can be even more awkward when we're talking about that topic with our kids with disabilities. Um, but like everybody, that's an important thing that we need to have that conversation with. So I told Stephen maybe in the spring, we could have him come back on live and he could do one of his new topics. Um, he also said that he's working on a presentation that goes back to his talking about his childhood story and kind of doing almost a task analysis of what happened to him and what could have been done differently. So I think that will be like a tremendous, you know, um, presentation for him to do not only for parents, but for teachers. And hopefully that's going to make a big change for lots of kids in our lives. So let me check on Facebook and see if we have any other comments. I guess he's still out there rebooting. It's like, oh dear. Um, I don't know why. It's because like we got on at seven o'clock and we tried his PowerPoint and it was all working fine. And then Stephen and I were just chatting. And now I'm not seeing him. So that's frustrating. Um, conversation starter. So let's see. Yeah, Brandy asked Flagstaff. Um, and Natalie said, oh my God, Charmaine, is there a chance my Drew will go to college? Yes, there is. You know, and I don't know, Natalie, if I told you how Dylan went to college. Um, he went to the University of Colorado in Colorado Springs. Now for Dylan, he audited classes where he took the classes but wasn't given credit. But I'm for sure if that's something that Drew wants to do, he would be able to go and take classes and get credit. And, you know, and it, we just have to see if that's one of his, you know, dreams and desires. But there's so much more support now on different college campuses. Um, one of the websites that you could go to, Natalie, is called Think College, and they list in each state where there's um, you know, both two-year and four-year programs that support students with disabilities. Um, there's been a lot of students with autism that have gone to college. And more recently, it's been students with intellectual disabilities that have been supported on college campuses. So now there's two people in the meeting. There's Stephen. Hey. A blue screen on staff. Um, so, Stephen, do you want to say, any, I don't know if you heard my introduction to you and then I was just talking about your trip to Australia and such, but do you want, I introduced you as a disability rights advocate from San Diego and how you got your master's in Flagstaff. And I was trying to remember, is that the universe, Arizona University? Which one is that? Northern Arizona University. Okay. And what did you get your master's in? Was it communication? Um, disability policy. Oh, cool. Okay. Well, welcome to the show. I'm glad we got you back on. Brandy is here live with us from Pueblo. She and her son Clay are watching you. And then we have another friend of Brandy's, Rachel. And we have a friend of mine, Natalie, from Idaho that's on. So do you want to see about sharing your screen with your PowerPoint? And my, my sister-in-law, Janice, is with us. Hey, Janice. Another friend from Idaho, Kathy, has joined us. So will it work for you to share your screen?
Okay, is everything on? Well, I don't see your screen yet, so did you put your PowerPoint up? I see you on the screen, but I don't see your slide. Are you? Now do you? No, I just still see you. So did you do you have to go? I'm trying to remember when you did it before. Did you go to the application and then that brought up the PowerPoint slide? Did that do it? Yep, loading presentation. Da da. So I see that with your slides on the side. Do you want to make it full screen for your one slide or do you want to go like that? For you. Yeah, yeah, there we go. Full screen. You're you're on it. You're up. Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Stephen Hinkle. Sorry for the computer crash where I had to reboot. But I'm a disability rights advocate. I'm an international speaker. And I'm joining you today from San Diego, California. And I will be speaking to you today about the hidden curriculum. And Basically, that refers to the social part of school. And we will be talking about this because when I was a child, I'll just give you a little background before I start. I'm a, um, I, when I was little, I had no friends for many years. I was the kid on the playground who was always picked last day after day after day for months, if not years. And I had no friends. And, and, and growing up was very hard. I was diagnosed with autism at age five. And I'm gonna be speaking today about this and so forth. And I will start about the social side of school, which is our topic today. But I want everybody to think back to what were their memories of school. And for me, it was a lot of academics, although in high school, I did get involved with the drama and did tech crew for theater shows. But for much of my younger years, I didn't have as many memories, but I'm sure some of you probably remember things like prom um, in high school or in elementary school, you probably remember field day or some of the middle school, probably some of the clubs you joined or some of them may have been involved with the choir or the band or, or theater shows or, or played a sport or Maybe some of you were involved with the yearbook or the, or the some of the other things that you might have been involved with. And what we really need to do is is to really think about what memories the kids you work with or when kids going through school would really like to see in their picture books when you look back at school. And the reality is there's a lot that really goes on. A lot of these memories are created during what I call the unstructured times of the school day. And we often forget about this. A lot of parents probably think about IEPs and what academics and how is the kid doing in reading and how is the kid doing in math and, and how are they doing in science and so forth. But there really is a lot of times in the school day that kids are socializing the kids are interacting, should be interacting with other children. 
and these are times least likely to be graded, least likely to be heard about in IEP meetings. But still, the amount of time in one of these days is very, I mean, in the course of a school year, we're really looking at a lot of time here. So time. Uh, passing period and lunch alone can be just shy of 200 hours in a school year. Uh, depends on the school, but and then and you add a couple hours after school each day from two to four or whatever, twice a week. 36 weeks that could be another 72 hours and in high school when you're up some of the things could be even more to add to that so we really are thinking about what's happening on the buses what happenings within the halls at recess at lunch what's happening on the play fields what's happening in the theaters what's happening during Sports, what's happening? These were all times that I, when I was younger, I didn't even know what to do, much less know how to make a blend. And we have to start supporting our kids during these unstructured times. And these are a couple of quotes from beginners, the right to our mind, but the left to are from others, and I think they really speak to the extent of being a non-vicarious learner. The first point is, I can't speak for other kids, but I'd like to be very clear about my own feelings. I did not ever want to be alone, and all those child psychologists who said, John prefers to play by himself were dead wrong. I played with myself because I was a failure at playing with others. And the lesson behind this quote is that play is a learned skill, and we have to support people in play and know how to play. This one I relate to, a, next one I relate to a lot because it, it really happened to me as a child, but it's from Baron and Baron from back in 1992. I had no idea how to make friends or to fit in with other kids at school. I know now the way I behave made everything worse and I couldn't help it. Again, friendship is a learned skill and we have to support our kids with friendship. The next one is my quote. And my friend Jody Robledo, who's a professor at Cal State San Marcos dissertation. My parents told me not to talk to strangers. I believe the only people who are not strangers were people my parents introduced me to. For years, I thought classmates were strangers I couldn't talk to. And, that, and I believe that all the way up through middle school, if you can believe it. It's very sad. But with autism, you don't know, recognize the exceptions to rules as easy, and very often we take things literally. So we often forget about uh, exceptions to rules, and we, I thought stranger, as I know these people, I thought they were strangers. Yes, it's the social realm, but your assumption I don't want relationships or I can't be a friend is more disabling. This is the question that sometimes I ask the audience, but we don't have a way to do that, but I want you to think about this in your mind. Um, this was a question that inspired me because when I was little, they often did speech therapy doing communication work and we did all kinds of communication stuff in speech class for social skills. 
But we often forgot about some other realms. And this inspired me to ask for my di dissection of the hidden curriculum is can it be taught effectively in a speech therapy setting without any recreation or leisure instruction? And I have a feeling that a lot of you probably got the correct answer, which is no. But the reality is, is too often, we often focus on communication for social skills. And while communication is one tiny realm of many, there are a lot more realms to social skills for many other areas. And yes, recreation and leisure, which is the first ones we're going to be talking about, are critical parts. You also have visual and performing arts, which includes things like your music, your drama, your your art, visual art, your your sculptures, your drawing and painting, things like that. Uh, and then you have school spirit, which includes things like the different clubs and the different activities and some things they do at lunch and after school. Um, communication and conversations, that's still important, but it's not the whole picture. Things I include things like talking to people and, and things like that, and reading your body language. Then we have uh, manners and etiquette, which are the social rules for the different environments. Then we have uh, friendships, which includes things like making friends. And then we have relation, really relationships with others. And then the last four, which I don't recommend starting until you get to the upper grades and even into adulthood in some cases. But when, when relationships get more advanced in the teenage and an adult level, then you add things like dating, romance, intimacy, and sexuality to that list. So you really have to think about, there's a whole big piece to this. And I'm going to go as we go through, give you some tips for many of these different pieces as we go through this today. And just to prove my point, we look at our graphics here, you look at the top picture and it's playground like you see in elementary school. And then over to your right, you look at theater shows and then at the bottom you see you have the prom and then sports. So there really is a lot of skills involved with each of these. And about half of them, a lot of this talk today is based on things I didn't know is when I was a little boy. And the reality is why do schools offer extracurricular? It's to build culture, it's to build friendship, get to know and then learn a lot of things you might not see on a standardized test, like the arts, fitness, sports, things like that. And usually with Inclusion in that realm promotes disability awareness and that sort of thing. But the key concept I want you to experience is this slide. It is called um, think, Thinking Like a Social Beginner. And one thing is persons with autism don't always infer how to do things like for example, you can put them in an environment. Let's say you're out on the playground and I said, go play Charmaine or go play Amanda or go play Bob or go play Laura or go play Elaine or whatever. The real thing is 
is there was a lot of skills associated with that activity. And we cannot assume that you can just put them in an environment and they know what to do. With autism, you may have to teach step by step how to do this. And it can take a lot more concentration to do this. And oftentimes, we don't decipher exceptions to rules very easily. And we tend to take things literally as someone with autism. So it's very good. And the most important thing, a lot of assessments for this, mostly just taste, communication, and behavioral management. And we have to look beyond that and really look at the concept, if they know a single activity, like for example, let's say, Charmaine, let's say you know uh, how to play tag. Doesn't always mean you know how to floor, play four square. Or doesn't mean you know how to act on a stage or to, to be someone's friend. So we really have to start looking at which activities one knows and doesn't know. In reality, there's no age equivalency in this. And the other thing is, to be social, I recommend adapting or doing activities that are age appropriate. Can you imagine a high school kid playing with baby crib toys? On the other hand, if that high school kid wants to find a date and go to the prom, is that much more appropriate? So in reality, should be, and there are many activities can be adapted for many different levels of skill levels. Like, for example, you can have somebody in sports. I know somebody with disabilities who's a cheerleader. I know, I've met somebody who's... Um, Drama can be adapted to many levels, whether you're a participant or an actor or a tech crew member. There's so many things you can really do. So rec leisure should be at the core of any social skills training and really not take it for granted. So some of the activities I think would be good to know to be social is to know how to play the games on the fields. I'm sure some of you have climbed on a jungle gym or pumped on a swing or played four square or played soccer or played, gone down the slide or know how to get across the monkey bars or played basketball or volleyball. I bet a lot, it's so important that we start modeling some games like this and encouraging our kids with the special needs to have a chance to play them and know how to play them. I think this strategy could actually go for a second here. Um, could actually go very well with um with, with uh, okay. Um, could actually be used for all of our kids to learn how to play games like this. And these are some other ones I remember from the child. How many of you remember? Goose. <laughs> I remember that one. <laughs> or Simon says, raise your hand. Or Sun's red light, green light. Or throw the frisbee around. Or way that parachute thing that they put a ball on or whatever, whatever. I think we ought to make sure that they understand these games and know how to play and the rules of and things like that. So, Stephen, how, how do you recommend that these games be taught? I mean, is it a teacher? Is it a para? Is it another student? Is it the parent practicing with them at home? What do you recommend? I recommend going to the playground and teaching people how or one way would be definitely in PE class. I think this would benefit all kids in the school if they 
noticed what was commonly done at recess and made sure all of the kids, and especially the lower grades, um, understand how to play. So when they go out at recess and they know the game and they like it, they can easily do learn how to play it. Yeah, that's a great idea is to do that teaching part during PE and then have them practice it at recess time. And then parents and others can help as well or the recess staff if they don't know what game should be familiar with what's played out there. Not to interfere with unstructured play, but think about from the perspective of a child, where would you go for help? that that's available. I think there's a lot of things they can do here to make this inclusive. Another thing as kids get older, I think they should understand when they go to camp or things like this, understand some of the common outdoor things, like how to hike, rock climb, or how to ride a horse, or how to boat, or how to fish, or get up on a ropes course. That was scary, but I did it. And I was in camp um, things, nature trails. And it's very important that we get kids outdoors again and be active to the best of their ability. And there are many ways of adapting things like this as well. And these are some of the other skills associated with outdoor play. And I think one should understand how do you form a team, like, for example, I could say Bobby and Amy and Laura and, and Ben and um, Christopher and Samantha and stuff. Do you want to be on a team with me in a sport on the field? Or how do you join an existing game properly? Or what do kids say to each other? And, things like that, or someday play in a tournament or competition sports, which gets a little bit more competitive. And yes, there are sports that are adaptive. And there are some, even that are people with disabilities that also are athletic enough to be on regular things. Like I one time met Anthony Ioni from Michigan, I attended Michigan State, and he was the first person with autism to play college basketball. And this was a top conference Division One team. Michigan State. So reality is we can participate in sport. And then the next concept we're going to cover is indoor play. You know, like playrooms and daycare rooms and going over to someone's house in a play-type environment. And I think it's important that we teach kids how to take turns, how to play with others, the different toys and what they're used for, how to clean up a mess. I think kids should be familiar with things like how do you play a board game like Sorry or Trivial Pursuit or to play like Rummy or Uno or some of the other kid games with, I recommend kids playing gambling games, but some of the kid card games that they play and video games, uh, I think a little bit to understand and how do you play the different toys? You know, there might be different toys or action figures or dolls or Legos or things like that there. I think reading some of the books, it was harder for me to read fiction because of, of influences and things like that. We understand the characters and what kinds of cartoons kids might watch and some of the other imaginative play and, and things like that. You know, Brandy from Pueblo was saying that her son Clay loves to play the card game Uno. That's cool, um, but there are many things they can learn in this. And then going on now, um, um, game rooms. Um, I think as kids get a little older, they should understand how do you play some of the games 
you might find in a game room or an arcade type setting like pool and ping pong and uh, foosball and air hockey and you know like we put a quarter in the arcade machine or swipe the cards as some of them do now and then you play like a video game or like a race car you might might play like one that we move a character or things like that and ski ball or things like that so Stephen, do you think it's helpful for i don't know for parents or brothers and sisters or somebody to kind of look at like all the different steps like you're saying like at an arcade how you buy that game card or how you put it in the machine how do you know how many more tokens you have or so do you right. recommend that they really look at all the different steps that have to be taught Yep, that would be good if they don't know or don't figure it out on their own. Some people will, some people won't. I was kind of technical, so that was important. Now I'm going to go on to school and non-school based social activities. I think one thing is so important here is to understand some of these fun things that schools might offer. Like, what do you do if you go on a field trip? What do you do if you want to make go on a playground? What do you want to do at a dance? I Before 12th grade, I didn't even think of going to dance because I didn't know how to dance. And talent show, how does one get a talent? Or to understand the different things, like when is there a pizza party? Or, you know, to invite others to their birthday party. So these were things I wasn't aware of. Although I did a few things, I didn't understand all this. I did do the science there when I was younger. And then in middle school, it gets a little bit more advanced. Um, I think at this level, kids need to understand what the different clubs are and how to be a good club member. I think the same, they should know how to dance. I think they should understand if school has sports. Not all of them do that. I think... Um, they should understand what goes on in the auditorium, like concerts and things, and don't know what goes in a yearbook, know what, I didn't know what, what I was, I, when I was in middle school, I did not get invited to a single sleepover, I didn't even know that I was supposed to do that, um, how to, this is the age where people do this. And then going on, the next slide is high school. And this is even more of a social experience. One of the big things, of, of, especially the bigger high schools, is interscholastic athletic rivalry, like a football or basketball or, or, or tennis or other things against things. Uh, dances are a big part, from Sadie Hawkins to uh, ASB Ball to prom, to know what those are. I'll tell you a funny story. My first definition of prom was programmable, read-only memory, a type of computer chip. That's how it knew. Um, I didn't know the function of student government or what that even did when they put out of both things. Uh, so I need, I think people should understand that all this stuff goes on and how to do this kind of stuff. And then in college, I had more things like sports, obviously, and um, this is the age where people go out dancing and clubbing and things like that. Um, school spirit, this is another part of school that the support teams missed. Like for example, twin day, I didn't know how to get a twin, become a twin with anybody. I never thought of bringing my pajamas to school. <laughs> no, what, what um, a food fair was about. I didn't know what, what three-legged race was. I didn't know what a pep rally I actually had to ask in 10th grade. Um, things like this, we need to really start modeling some of these kinds of things 
that will go on in the spirit week and make sure our kids understand what to do and be prepared for that. Student government, this is another piece that was on things like the functions of student government. They should understand that they're planning the events and the culture and how to run for an office or know whose things. Of course, some type who to vote for and what the issues are, but the pop, I know sometimes it ends up being a popularity contest, but that's to be expected. And these are a lot of skills now that people need to know that are not in a textbook, like how to use one paint a picture. For example, I knew how to handwrite, and I wasn't good at it, but I didn't know what made other graphics or the strokes for that, or how to play an instrument, or how to do things, or, or how to swim, or how to cook, or how to, how to play things. And reality is you're not going to see any of this on the test, but there really are educational experiences of their own. I recommend for all things like how do you draw, how do you paint, how do you fold, how do you um, measure things like do things with clay, so forth. For performing arts, I recommend how people learn how to read lines and the emotions of lines and how to sing and, and dance and act. And, and the, when I was younger, I'll tell a true story. I, I was involved with the technical theater and I did tech crew and it really showed me the inner workings of the stories, things that important happen. And when I heard Hugo in my so I worked the lighting board, and when I realized the audience, things like that. Another part I think is important are parties. I think want you to understand how do you play things with like Pimatel and the Donkey and Bingo and some of the kid games that I had, or uh, how to dance, or how to swim, or how do you get the kinds of conversations people have at parties and, and ask the common kid stuff that they might do, or when they get a little older, they might get invited to, to like dinner for Thanksgiving or Christmas, where it's more like a formal dinner where you have to know the etiquette of that. And also to know where kids hang out and things that are not sponsored by the school. I think it's important that they know where do kids typically go in the community? What things do they like to hang out? Like, is there a movie theater, a mall, a rec center, a parks, a coffee, Starbucks, a restaurants, a fast food, a bowling alley, the mall? And the, Make sure kids with disabilities are hanging out sometimes at these kinds of places. Stephen, one of the parents that's listening to you, Natalie, she has a question for you. She said, Stephen, do you recommend that we try to push our son to be involved in all these extracurricular activities? We feel that we set him up for failure. I'd appreciate your advice. One thing is, it's is to try. I think when I was younger, I didn't know what I was missing. That might be the issue. I would recommend starting with some things that they like, which I'll get to a lot in section two and three real, real fast. But, but I, but I will recommend that. To try some things, you might try like one or two and see what they like based on things like if they're interested in being good at a sport, they might want to join the team, or let's say they're interested in stage stuff, so they might want to join the drama club or, or whatever. So basically to do this, and it may be that he's not not that he's not interested, maybe he's a beginner 
at knowing how, so it's important to teach and model that. And then there are other things like sports that are not part of school, and then the full age and theater groups and other things in the community as well that people are involved with. And then I'm going to go on to know what's out there, where to turn for help, and so on. And I'm going to go on to our next section about that on manners and etiquette. And I think it's important that people understand things like the subtle language, like facial expressions and subtle cues and who's related to whom and things like that. Persons with autism don't always pick that up, so we have to model that more and so forth. I think it's important another skill is conversations. And this is so important because we often model adult to child type conversations. What we need to start modeling is what happens when kids talk to other children. And that may include things like when you make jokes, uh, what are some so common social topics, appropriate language. And that is so important because what an adult's going to say in a principal's office to a kid is going to be very different than when kids are laying down about to go to bed talking in a slumber party. So there's a really big difference there. And these are just some things that kids would typically talk about to others, like their personal life, who they like and dislike, their friends, their school, uh, things happening in the media, jokes and gossip and things, hobbies, what things they're involved with, and bantering humor. This is another piece we missed, like humor, like the slang and joke meanings of things, like, for example, what's up? My answer to that was the ceiling. And I didn't get jokes very easily. So we need to model which jokes are good, what is the in slang of the era, what is the meaning of that, how to banter in a banter conversation. If you notice, I have Urban Dictionary up there. It's because that's the meaning of slang. Um. Some other ways to learn humor. Things like, for example, I didn't know which ones were, were from TV shows people used, or which ones were humor phrases, or which ones were sarcasm, and which ones were sexual, and which ones were were, were, were symbolized something else. Because an autistic brain takes words and they generally get the first, the, the real meaning, face value. And it takes them longer sometimes to decipher that it might be slang for something. And if they're, and then also to understand, next thing is to understand your social graces, like a please and thank you, how to care for someone, how to open the door when you handshake, um, respect for property. And each environment has a, a specific set of social rules associated with it. I think another thing to do, understand is they understand how do you invite someone from school like to your house, how do you, like for your party or your play date or things like that, and to know who's invited and who's not and how to respond and that sort of thing, and to understand how to be a good host at someone's house, like for example, have everything ready, make sure uh, there's some food and if they're going to sleep over, that sort of thing, and how to get reservations or advance tickets if you need that or whatever. Um, push the wrong button. Another thing I failed was when I was in an audience, I didn't know when to laugh, I did not know when to clap. I remember in elementary school going into the the or cafeteria for an assembly. It was one of those cafeterias with a little stage in it. Sitting down and not knowing when to laugh, not knowing when to clap, 
not knowing when to hand wave, not knowing when to give a standing ovation. And when I was sitting in the audience, it was great music, but I was confused as the responses when they came out out of the blue. And the same is true with athletics to understand the phrases you cheer on, like, go team, go, or touchdown, or great oop, or whatever, or home run. To understand, like, dress and fashion, to know what to wear to things is important, whether it's casual versus formal versus semi-formal to different things like that is important. I know how to use social media properly, which is so important, like privacy and copyright and things like that, and when the risk of things going viral. I think it's important that people understand how do you eat at the table, like how to use your fork and knife properly to know who to talk, how to talk to when you're dining, to chew with your mouth closed, basic etiquette of the dining table, and even more advanced situations. Like let's say you go, at a, go over to somebody's house for Thanksgiving dinner, for Christmas dinner, and then you have a place setting with a lot of forks out to in. And obviously if it's a low light, like a nice restaurant, it's it's things there, and you always play the blessing sometimes, or you pass that, how to pass the dishes around. Like, let's say you got bread that's going around to everybody, or whatever. Or it's a three course meal, like you might have salad and then a main course, and then the dessert. Understand how that works. And then understand some more formal events, like what do you do if it's a nice restaurant, or go out to a dance, or go out to a game, or or fancy party or something where you have to dress up and there's manners associated with that. This was another skill that I struggled with, dancing. Before 12th grade, I did not know how to dance. I learned in probably the worst ballroom you could ever find, <laughs> the special ed office. <laughs> room in the back of a library. Huh. We need to get people out of that room and teach them how do you dance and how do you invite people to the dance and or the difference between fast music and slow music and what moves do you do for different things, dances and different cultures and some of the group ones like the YMCA or the electric slide or to know how to ask someone to get be, to dance with you or how to you know, raise your hand like that to twirl and, and so forth. I think that's something. Well, Stephen, Brandy wrote on here that um, she knows that you can dance now because she's seen your moves at the karaoke night at PIX conferences. Yes, I've learned a lot since 12th grade. <laughs> And then another thing I struggled with going on is teasing and tattling. I tattled too much as a child, so I didn't know when it would cost me a friend. I didn't know when it was in the gray area. I didn't know when it's okay to tease. These things are gray, and yes, some of it may be against the rules, but what is normal is important to model and when. You don't understand about bullying. If it gets too much, you're being bullied. You should always get help and things like that. And then know where you're allowed to go, where you're not allowed to go to be good sport. And getting along with people who don't agree with you. Like, for example, let's say you voted for Hillary Clinton, but you're going down to a very conservative place where everybody was for Donald Trump, so, for example, you don't want to talk about politics there. Um, I meant to know the social rules, my best strategy for this is to understand one environment at a time, to learn 
like for example the etiquette rules of a formal restaurant is going to be different from a movie theater from a classroom from a from a a stadium from recess from a bowling alley and so forth and sometimes i had trouble not knowing the rules nine times out of ten a behavior therapist once told me that they forget about that not it's the mo their behavior is often caused by someone not knowing the etiquette rules of a new environment they encounter. And I'm going to go on to our third section here, which is friendship. And it's not always friends at first sight for people with special needs, and it can be very hard work. When I was younger, I didn't know the skills of how to make friends and how to be a friend. And things get more complex when intimacy and sexuality become involved. But the first thing you do is to understand that not everybody knows how to make friends. And some people may have to learn it by direct teaching. And so forth. And to know the, the first thing to know about friendship is to know the difference between what is an acquaintance and a friend. Acquaintances you don't associate much personal level. There might be co-workers, people you don't hang out with during your life. Friendship goes a little deeper. People you do invite, you see in a social realm, and it goes into a non-working realm. And like, for example, you might invite your friend over for dinner, or you might invite your friend to an event, or your friend might invite you to their party or things like that. And friends do not get paid. They do not get extra credit and friends for doing something nice. They only get one thing back, and that is companionship. So they really understand the difference. And friends is about trusting each other, being there in times of need, and be kindness, and talking and sharing stories together. And some of the skills that I think are important is I can't emphasize this one enough, knowing how to invite a friend to, to things, knowing what friends talk about to other friends. It's important that people understand how do you get to know a friend, what are their interests, what are their strengths, what do they like to do, what things, some background about their family, things like that. How to nurture them. You might do something and then your friend invites you to something. Um, how do you play? And be open to trying new things. I don't mean get in trouble with the law on this one, but if your friend asks you to try a new activity that you've never done, be open, things like that. And these are some of the common things kids would do with their friends. Like invite them to a play date or sleepover or a, a party or uh, at, talk to or eat together in the lunch room or some of the little notes kids pass. I didn't know to even write when nobody ever passed one to me, but I don't want that to happen to any other kid. And then our next piece is about, and this is a goal of mine to someday find a partner and date, but I'm going to express some of the skills we need to address here. This is a very condensed version. And when it comes to dating, persons with disabilities might be far less versed about what is happening in relationships, like what is happening at night, what they're saying on the phone from the long talks, what's happening on the weekends, what's happening at home, what happens when the bedroom door is closed in private, things like that. And we have to, and I want you to get over the myth 
that persons with autism or any other disability are asexual. That is not the case at all. The reality is they may not know how to develop romance by vicarious inference. Instead, we may have to support them, like how does one get one to be their boyfriend or their girlfriend? How does that differ from a normal friendship? Um, this may go up to dating each other or someday, um, someday living together and so forth, how to be intimate nights out, um, someday living. So I think understanding things like putting your arms and the hugs and the kisses and some of the mannerisms and touches that go on with romance are important to model. I think obviously they need to know how that's different and understand the pleasure side of this. Like, for example, how do you ask a girl out? Or how does he know when one's flirting with you? Or how do you know when somebody has a crush on you? We can model the nonverbal signs that that may happen. And how does one the chemistry build up to someday? getting married so that's the part of, of of support that we often forget and not to offend anyone or any i know everybody's culture is different or religions are different but understand how to how to build a sexual relationship properly and understand things like the humor and the other things that go along with that and then our last section is on policy and how do we undercut the barriers? And this is a condensed version because of the time, but one of the things we have to do is to realize our kids um, might not know that some of the things exist, the extracurriculars and the fun stuff, especially if the special ed is in the back corner, which it often is, that's something you ought to change if you see that. But these are these posters are often where they see things. Sometimes if someone's not as social, they may not be getting as many invitations. So that's another barrier. And sometimes these things are not as well promoted, activities aren't well promoted in special lab. Sometimes the other thing is your district might not want to pay for a power, but should always wait, question whether that's really necessary or not. Sometimes there's other things, barriers with grades and other things. But the most important skills is that people should know what's out there and what's going on. We should ask people interest of what they might want to join to try some things out of their age and their culture in the social scene. And you can always know your youth culture, which is so important because see where do kids go, what things do they like, what things are in, what things are hot, what, what activities are fun, and so forth. The other part of school that we often don't think about is passing period. I have seen kids, children, I've been a victim of this myself, where that we were pulled early to pass in a quiet hall. But if you really think about that, what does that do from a social skills perspective? It's isolating. But on the other hand, I think, especially for those kids that are capable, we should be allowing them to go in the halls with their friends and exit with their friends and be able to have conversations with their friends, not just the parents shooing the other kids away. But if you really think about that passing time being as much as 105 hours, yes, that's more than an entire subject for one semester by 15 hours when you add up all the passing time. And 
in, in, and things like that. It's much better to teach them how to interact and to have them walk with a peer or a friend. Next part is to understand about being able to sit and eat lunch with their friends. The special ed should not be at a separate table set up for the convenience of a power or convenience of a special ed teacher. Instead, what we should be doing is asking them to um, have access to their social skills and so forth. And to be able to talk to other children. Are you still there, Charmaine? Yeah, yeah you're doing great. <clears throat> and to not interfere with kid to kid talk. Because in reality, that's what kids are going to be invited to the parties. That's what kids are going to be saying. And be able to especially like kids to have access to that. And I would even recommend going as far if they're non-verbal that they have access to the communication system with enough info to be able to have a conversation with their peers during lunch and have access to that lunch. Be able to choose the table they want to be. And the same is true with entering and exiting. If you notice, if you go into any school, You'll notice there's a lot of kids that talk to each other just before school, just after school, um, things in the halls and things like that for socializing. We need to make sure our kids with disabilities have the chance to do that too and not miss out on the, on the things. And I have seen schools so bad that um, that where the special ed bus comes to the back of the school where everybody else goes out the front door and all the kids are dismissed 15 minutes early each day for the convenience of the bus driver and the powers. And you really think 15 minutes a day early adds up to 45 hours over the course of the school year or half of a semester that they're missing from class plus the social time. And we really need to start letting them go in the same door and interact with their peers. And the work cannot make the special ed room in the back corner of a back bungalow or in the basement. Because again, not sending a message that they're unsocial. And we should, about the, the amount of time spent in segregation should be minimized. If they can be in a regular class inclusively, that is a lot better than segregation and so forth. And the other thing, we're getting close to the end. Um, I want everybody to know the the, so, the signs of hidden curriculum failure in a child. Chances are this fake report card that I made, it was nobody's privacy, but I made it just for the slide. But you don't see the hidden curriculum on an average report card, do you? You're only going to see it on a test score. But the reality is there are a lot of signs one should be looking for that indicates failing the hidden curriculum. Like kids behind always by themselves at lunchtime. Kids with no friends. If a kid is always by themselves and doesn't interact with any other kids or over the wallflower day after day after day. That's a sign that they should be evaluated for potential social skills intervention if they need it because 
one time sometimes it's okay to be shy but if they see that another big sign is they're participating in very few or none of the extracurricular activities or spirit acting i'm not saying everybody has to do everything because that's not realistic but certainly nothing for a long time indicates another like this in this uh social screen deficit um don't know the common things of youth culture that the other kids are um, no that's another sign or they're not fitting in and as for the last sign about poor narrative reading scores a lot of reading comprehension especially with fiction stories involves social skills knowledge to infer and that's a sign because I, I could read technical stuff fine but struggle with humanities for that reason and one of the things i want to conclude because we're getting to the end right charmaine yes i want to conclude with actually i'll mention one more thing um a lot of the tests for social skills given by speech pathologists and ot's don't test social skills correctly i recommend observing I recommend seeing which activities they know how to do versus not know. And I recommend taking age equivalency scores on behavior tests with a grain of salt. Yes, you can learn some things from them, but the reality is there may be activities that they don't know that are not being tested especially the hands-on or the, or the knowledge. But I want everybody to give the child a chance to succeed socially, a chance to make friends and be a friend, to be able to grow up being a social being, to be able to complete the journey from preschool to grad school with act and be able to participate in many of the fun things that their non-disabled peers participate in and to be able to fill the picture book full of memories that will that when they grow up and have kids and grandkids will be able to show to the next generation and be able to have fun looking back at their childhood Thank you, and I will take a few questions from the audience if they have any. Well, thank you so much, Stephen. It's I'm so glad I got to hear you um, speak again. Your message is so critical, not only to us as families, but for the educators. I do have a couple of questions from people that are on live with us. One was you know, she's looking at her son transitioning to middle school and thinking about all those down times that happened during middle school. And how how can we as parents or how can teachers, how can we help our children prepare and learn what to do in those down times at middle school? Is down time referred to social time? I just want to clarify that. Yeah, so like the lunch time, you know, there's passing periods, those times when you're not sitting in a classroom, but all those social things are going on at school. The first thing I recommend is to see what is going on at the middle school and to model what other kids would do during those times. And maybe like encourage them to eat lunch with their other classmates or, or friends or to talk to them in the halls or to as they walk together and to possibly see if they could find a classmate or two to invite over to their house or to to try a few of the extracurricular or social things that might go on like 
Bowery Carnival or school activity or or maybe join an extracurricular or a club of their liking, interest like art club or science club or something, or or if they're or perform in a show or be in a talent show or to understand or to be prepared for any spirit activities that come up and and how to do them, make sure the kid knows what they are and how to participate properly, and that's the best strategy. Again, think like a child who's in middle school. Yeah, and you know, I think back when Dylan was getting ready for middle school, one of the things that helped us is that he had an older brother or and sister, so both of them could talk with Dylan and kind of give him the lowdown on what would happen as a sixth grader and you know, I think for families that don't have older brothers or sisters, if you can find maybe a neighbor that has older kids or, you know, if there's cousins. But I think so many times if kids can have a chance to talk to each other, that helps versus as parents, us trying to talk with our middle school kids that might not be too, you know, cool on listening to us. That's good. That's a great idea. Anybody else have a question? Um, one mom was asking if there was a way that she could get a copy of your PowerPoint slides. Uh, yes. Uh, send me her email, and then I can uh, send you a Dropbox link for it. Okay. That'd be great. And I think as an advocate, you've helped me remember all of these parts of that hidden curriculum. And so when I'm helping parents advocate at IEP meetings, I need to be bringing up the hidden curriculum more. So that's addressed in the meeting and also addressed in the IEP for students. Uh, yes, and I think uh, IEP goals and objectives should always have some social goals as well as things and we make, make sure that we're getting the hidden curriculum and, and each school is different, but certainly there is a hidden curriculum to each school. Just what things are in it may vary from school to school and district to district. Right, right. Um, so yeah, people are just really appreciative and there's lots of Thanks and loves and thumbs up coming across the screen for you. So people are really appreciative of you taking your time out tonight, Stephen. And like I said, if if you would like to come back in the springtime when you have some of your other topics um, ready for presentations, I'm sure parents I'm will already, not. Already, but I could, I could, there's just one that I'm still building, but all the others that I'm, new ones are available or done before. One I did a challenge or middle, another I attach, so. Okay, so there's several people that want your slides. Would it be, I don't know if you want me to put your email address on Facebook because then everybody could see that or for privacy reasons, would it be yeah. better for me to get the parents put email? That back. It's right there. Oh, there we go. <laughs> yes, good. Yeah, because I wanted to make sure that you I also share. wanted to say if anybody wants to to someday have me come out and speak to their school or things, I'm available for for talks and stuff. And I presented in 24 states and recently in Australia. So... Um, I'm available out there, and and I do professional development soft work if you need that. Yeah, so I really encourage, you know, if there's a school district that has professional development for teachers, you know, days for that, to encourage your administrators to um, invite Stephen. Um, obviously, they need to pay for his transportation from San Diego, but and his honorarium for speaking. But 
I think we learn so much from um, self advocates that are adults. So, you know, I was thinking in Idaho, we have a state um, council for exceptional children conference every year, or we have some other community conferences. So I'm going to be talking to some of the leaders of those conferences and encouraging them to invite Stephen to come to Idaho. <laughs> So do you have any parting words before we sign off here, Stephen? I want to thank everybody for attending. Um, I was in, in presentation mode, so I couldn't see everybody's comments, but I will take a look at it when I'm there. And I, I will um, speak. Um, I'm going to be doing some things upcoming, hopefully next year, some more speaking and then I'm going to be I'm I've been doing a lot of, of things and I want everybody to make sure that their kids pass the in curriculum or make sure every kid has a friend thank you and can you stop sharing your screen and then people can see you in larger life versus our little window that we see you now. So let's see if we can make that happen. You see me now? Go. Yes, there's Stephen. Large as life almost, right? <laughs> so thanks again, and we'll be in touch, and hopefully we'll have you back again for another Facebook Live show. Thanks. All right, thank you, everybody. Good night. Good night. I sign off now.